from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Library of Congress inaugural Hispanic Heritage Month 2014 event. Please stand as Karen Sweet joins us to present the national anthem. Karen Sweet is with the Library of Congress Corral, and she is one of our talented members of the Office of Copyright. Karen Sweet. Can you see <clears throat> by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave Thank you, Karen. That really was beautiful, and it definitely sets the tone for today. Uh, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the Library of Congress Hispanic Heritage Month inaugural event. Uh, all of this month, we will have events much like this one, uh, and they are brought to you in part uh, by Hispanic Cultural Society in association with the Law Library of Congress, the Office of Opportunity, Inclusiveness, and Compliance, the Hispanic Division, the Library of Congress Professional Association, the Daniel A.P. Murray African American Cultural Association, Library of Congress Globe, and the LC Chapter of Blacks in Government. My name is Mariel Buffington, and I am the Vice President of the Hispanic Cultural Society. Many of you know the President, Francisco Macias. Unfortunately, he's not able to be here today, so he has asked me to read some remarks on his behalf. Congressman Bella, Dr. Billington, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends. It is with great pleasure that we initiate this year's Hispanic Heritage Month celebration. As we celebrate the cul cultural contribution and heritage of our people, I would like for you to have a few things in mind. This year marks the 100th year of the birth of Hector Garcia, a hero who advocated for the rights of Hispanic Americans and who founded the American GI Forum. This year also marks the 50th anniversary of the American Civil Rights Act of 1964, which, without undermining the efforts of those whose names we already know, was steeped in the often unsung efforts of Hector Garcia, Gus Garcia, Carlos Cadena, James De Anda, Chris Aldrete, and John Herrera, among others. When we think of the American Civil Rights Act, we think of President Kennedy, but probably less about Lyndon B. Johnson, whose experience teaching at a segregated Mexican-only school in South Texas was the driving force that led to many of his actions. There is so much that Hispanics have done, but my major takeaway from an event not unlike this one is that as a people, it is no one's responsibility but our own to research, share, and make known our history, and to celebrate our American heroes with the aim that one day they may be allowed their proper place in our collective history as an American people of this great nation. 
Today you will hear about another chapter of Americana, and we hope you will help us share the world word of this other U.S. history. All right, please join me in welcoming the 13th Librarian of Congress, Dr. James Billington. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and I think we should begin by thanking that beautiful rendition of the of our national national anthem. So uh, a little round of applause for giving it everything. <clears throat> So, uh, lament, lamento mucho no poder comunicarme con ustedes en español, desafortunadamente. Yeah. Trouble is, um, <laughs> actually, I was twice visiting professor at the University of uh, Puerto Rico, uh, and that, I always began with that apology. Uh, so, anyhow, uh, welcome, everyone. We're very honored to have you all here every year. Americans observe National Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th. It's a month-long celebration, highlights and celebrates the histories, cultures, and contributions of Hispanic American citizens. First inaugurated as a week-long celebration in 1968 under President Lyndon Johnson. It was expanded to a month-long celebration, actually, in 1988 under President Reagan. This year's theme is Hispanics a legacy of history, a present of action, and a future of success. I like that round uh, historical perspective. Uh, it's an important year also for Hispanic Americans. It's been mentioned the 50th anniversary of the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in which we've just opened a, a major uh, exhibit. It's also the 60th anniversary of Hernandez versus Texas, a landmark U.S. Supreme Court case that solidified for all racial groups um, equal protection under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And it marks the 100th anniversary of the birth of Dr. Hector Garcia, has already been mentioned, the civil rights activist, founder of the American GI Forum. September 15th, that's today, is also an important day for Hispanic Americans. Uh, <coughs> It marks the anniversaries of independence for five Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. And on September 16th, we will celebrate Mexico's anniversary of independence, followed by Chile's on September uh, 18th. I would like to thank the Hispanic Heritage Planning Board and the Library of Congress Hispanic Cultural Society for the work they've done to prepare this month-long celebration, complete with conversations on poetic creation and transculturation, folkloristic uh, dance performances from Panama and Puerto Rico, uh, book talks, lectures on Iberian asceticism, and Latin American art, and a film screening, among other Hispanic-centered events. Uh, I must say we're, we have a Developing a Futures program, which is going to have added um, importance for our Hispanic activities and of course our Hispanic collection uh, is the first uh, reading room devoted explicitly to a non-English language um, uh, country uh, or set of countries and uh, um, actually we're going to have some important additions to it to uh, report before long. Anyhow, it's a great privilege to have a distinguished congressman, Filemon uh, Vela, uh, Jr., uh, with us today in this busy, busy time for all members of Congress, particularly for someone on the Homeland Security Committee on Agriculture as well. Anyhow, he's born in uh, Harlingen and raised in Brownsville, Texas, both of which located, of course, in the southernmost tip of Texas. Uh, congressman Vela hails from a long family line of public servants. Um, his late father um, served as a U.S. District Judge for more than two decades in the Brownsville um, uh, Division of the Southern District of Texas. His mother, who unfortunately passed away earlier this year, was the first woman mayor of Brownsville. For over 22 years, he has enjoyed a marriage to his accomplished wife, Judge, also Judge here, uh, Rose Vela. 
Uh, they reside in Brownsville, Texas. We're very grateful to them for being with us. And so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the representative of the 34th District of the Lone Star State, Philemon Vella. Thank you, Dr. Billington, and, and thank you to the uh, Society for giving me this great honor to uh, be with you here today. Before I um, start telling you a little bit about uh, the person I'm here to honor, uh, Judge Ronaldo Gatos, I do want to take a moment uh, to reflect on the life of Dr. Hector P. Garcia, uh, because 20, for about 20 years, my professional life as a lawyer uh, was based in Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, I moved to Brownsville about four to five years ago, which was my hometown, the birthplace of Judge Garza. But I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Hector P. Garcia in his medical offices. You know, by then, um, he had retired. Uh, but as you, uh, Doctor, one of the things Dr. Hector P. Garcia was known for, um, he was a tremendous political activist. And, and I remember walking in there as a young lawyer and um, had always had a keen interest in politics, but I remember walking in and um, he took me into a back room and he had his old uh, uh, recording studios where you know he would do all of his radio shows and um, he had such an impact in South Texas and as founder of the GI Forum did so much for the Hispanic veterans of the United States uh, that his place in history uh, is, is very well deserved. I did have uh, the pleasure uh, later on, after Dr. Garcia passed, uh, PBS did a documentary called Justice for My People, and my wife and I uh, were able to participate as one of the major donors uh, in, in that effort. And if you haven't seen that documentary, uh, it, it's a fantastic documentary, and, and uh, you know, I'd encourage you to, to, to really enjoy it as well. My wife loves documentaries. She made me stay up for the first part of the Roosevelt series last night. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, because of the Library of Congress, you know, we've had the pleasure of meeting uh, many of the people uh, who are uh, uh, part of that documentary because uh, the Library of Congress and Dr. Billington have uh, brought them in and invited members of Congress uh, over the last year and a half to participate in the presidential series. So uh, we, we thank you for that as well. But today, um, I, th I thought it was really important. I, I, uh, I was born, in, I was raised, I was born in Harlingen, uh, but immediately uh, my father, my father was the three of three, uh, one of three brothers uh, who became a lawyer in the late 50s, and uh, they were born and raised in the town of Harlingen, which is the place of my birth, place of my mother's birth, uh, but there were three young lawyers, and the town was small, and his older brother told him, uh, there's not enough room for us three. So you need to you need to go. Um, so my father moved his family uh, to Brownsville, which is the birthplace of, of Judge Reynaldo Garza. Uh, this man I knew um, in ways that I'm really in a very personal ma in a very personal way. I grew up with him. Um, he, of course, had been a judge. My father practiced law before him. My father eventually succeeded him as a trial judge, but I knew him personally as well. My memories of Judge Garza uh, go, um, you know, I, I remember uh, I went to a high school uh, in Brownsville called St. Joseph Academy, and the judge's house backed right up uh, to the high school. So, you know, my memories of Judge Garza are driving into school and seeing him leave to the courthouse, um, or, you know, on, 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 on weekends visiting the school and leaving there and watching him mow the lawn. Um, as a lawyer, you know, I would go visit my father at the federal courthouse, and at 3 o'clock every afternoon, he and uh, my father would play this dice game uh, for about 30 minutes and, um, you know, exchange uh, accusations. They, they, were, they, were, they were great, great friends, but they really they had a great, they both had senses of humor, and they both liked to give each other a hard time, right? Uh, but Judge Garza was born in Brownsville in 1915. Um, to, to give you a little bit about, uh, to, to, to put it in perspective in terms of uh, the district that I represent and, and, and the region uh, that D Judge Garza and I um, grew, 
grew up in. Uh, Brownsville, of course, is at the tip of Texas. My congressional district um, begins at the tip of Texas in Cameron County. I represent 400,000 people. On that southern border, there are four counties, Cameron County, Hidalgo County, Starr County, and Willisee County. Um, uh, the population has exploded. Uh, there are 1.2 million people that live there. Uh, the region is represented by uh, Congressman Ruben Hinojosa, Congressman Henry Cuellar, uh, and myself. Uh, my particular district actually goes up to Coastal Bend. It doesn't uh, reach Corpus Christi, but Dr. Billington and I were uh, talking about his visit to South Texas, and he visited the King Ranch. Well, the entire King Ranch is also part of my district, and of course, um, there, there's a very, very deep history uh, that connects the King Ranch to Brownsville and things that were occurring during the Civil War. Uh, Judge Godsa's interest in law actually uh, began as a child. Uh, he, he told a story, uh, he, he, he told a, a, a gospel story um, about when Christ said, he who is without sin uh, threw, throw the first stone and everybody left. Uh, Judge Godson, when he, to he told that story. Um, but when he went back home to visit his parents, uh, he was just eight or nine years old, he told his parents, you know, uh, what Jesus said struck me as a pretty good defense, and at a very young age, he had already decided that uh, law was the field he was going to pursue. He was born in 1915. He went to uh, what is, uh, back then was Brownsville Junior College, and eventually to the University of Texas uh, Law School. As a side note, you should know that um, the University of Texas uh, in Brownsville, uh, there are two universities in South Texas. One is the University of Texas in Brownsville, and one is the University of Texas Pan American, which is in Edinburgh, uh, historically in Texas. Uh, many of the uh, universities have not had access to the state uh, oil and gas revenues, but in this last legislative cycle, uh, the state legislature decided to give the University of Texas in Brownsville and the University of Texas in Pan American access uh, to state oil and gas revenues. So they merged the two universities, and next year um, you, you, we're, the, the new university will begin as the second largest Hispanic serving institution in the country, and a new, brand new medical school uh, will be created. But that's where uh, Judge Garza began uh, his, his, his educational career. In 1941, he was the first Mexican-American elected as a trustee to the Brownsville Independent School District uh, School Board. Uh, and during World War II, he served in the United States Army as a gunnery sergeant uh, in, in the city of Harlingen. Eventually, in 1947, he was elected as a city commissioner in Brownsville. And later on, he was appointed uh, to uh, Governor Connolly uh, to the Higher Education Board. It was a committee of 25. and um, Judge Godsa cast a deciding vote to create what is now the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, which is actually where the decision to merge these university, two universities uh, began. One thing about uh, during this period of the 1940s, Chris Christofferson was also, uh, also born and, and raised in Brownsville. And Christ Christofferson, if you've ever read much about him, he has a, a very compelling story. I won't go into it because here we're, we're here to talk about Judge Godsa, but he tells a story about uh, his father was in the military. He was based in Harlingen, uh, but, he, and, but Chris, uh, Christofferson lived in Brownsville. Uh, there was a Mexican-American soldier uh, who was coming back from World War II. His name was Jose Lopez, and uh, the town decided to do a parade for him. Uh, but back then, uh, and, and given even back then, the population of Mexican-Americans in Brownsville must have been uh, pretty significant, uh, but he was the first one to receive a Medal of Honor, Jose Lopez was, and they did a parade and Christofferson tells a story about going out to this parade uh, and looking around, and there wasn't uh, very many other people who were not Hispanic, um, and he has this real, real deep memory that he remembers even today about being in the parade and, and being real proud to uh, honor this first Hispanic, uh, you know, the, 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 this Medal of Honor recipient that had fought in World War II. He was a tremendous public servant. He was the president of the Brownsville Rotary Club, uh, director of the United Fund of Brownsville. He was the president of the Brownsville chapter of LULAC, treasurer of the Cameron County uh, Child Welfare, Bo Welfare Board, and a member of the advisory board of the Rio Grande Council of the Boy Scouts of America. He was a mentor to 57 law clerks 
who worked for him during his 43-year uh, judicial career. So every judge usually has about two law clerks at any given time. And this is going to become important because um, what I've decided to do is do my presentation but break it up. Um, and I'd like to take credit for it, but uh, when, the, when the judge passed away at his funeral, all of these law clerks and the people at the University of Texas Brownsville, along with his family, put together a great video uh, that, that I'm going to share here with you in just a minute. So Judge Godson was appointed, um, he was nominated to the United States District Court for the Southern, Southern District of Texas by President Kennedy uh, in March of 1961, and he was later confirmed uh, by the U.S. Senate in a, on April 13, 1961. Uh, he was appointed to a seat vacated by Judge James Allred, uh, who had also been, who later became a, a governor of the state of Texas and then went back to be a federal judge um, after uh, he had been governor. He was, uh, later on in 1979, uh, President Carter uh, nominated Judge Garza to the F United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. So he was the first Mexican-American uh, ever to be appointed to the federal judicial to, to a, a, a federal trial bench and the first Mexican American to ever be appointed uh, to the to the United States Courts of Appeals. A little background on the Southern District of Texas. It was created in 1902 um, by President Roosevelt. Uh, it initially sat in four cities: Brownsville, Laredo, uh, Galveston, and Houston. Uh, later on. A division was added in Corpus Christi and another in uh, McAllen and then in Victoria. Uh, today, um, this, this particular division, in particular the courts in Brownsville, Texas, have the largest number of federal criminal defendants prosecuted of any federal district in the United States. Judge Garza's uh, courtroom management style, um, probably stated best by uh, somebody I was very close to. Uh, my own father, who, who, whom I was named after. Um, Judge Garza was his mentor. He practiced in front of him, and, and later he served with him uh, when, when, after Judge Garza was appointed to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, my father ascended, was nominated by President Carter to be his successor at the, in, at the, in the trial bench. Uh, but my dad said, when you walked into his courtroom, uh, you knew Reynaldo Garza was a federal judge, and I promise you, that you conducted yourself commensurably. Uh, from my perspective, these two men were a lot alike. My, my father learned from Judge Garza, and uh, they, they were very stern, uh, they were very, were very strict, they adhered to rule of law, but they were also very, very compassionate people. Judge Garza expected lawyers to be prepared and understand the applicable law and facts of a case. Um, he, uh, displayed mercy and compassion, especially with, um, with, with poor defendants. Uh, Judge Garza always said that, uh, it, it, that, that, that rich people, it was easy for them to protect their rights because they could go and hire you know, good lawyers, but uh, a poor person really never knew what his rights were, so he was particularly protective uh, of the rights of, 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 of poor defendants. Judge Garza had a memorable and unmistakable presence. Um, it's hard to describe. Um, he, was a, he was a tall man. He had a very gruff voice. You're going to hear a little bit about him. You're going to hear him in just a little bit because we've got a little bit of video um, and, and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, but he had some very important cases as well. Um, in this case, it was called uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, before, versus the International Longshoremen's Association. This was a case uh, that was rooted in, in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The International Longshoremen uh, thought it was okay uh, to have separate but equal unions so that you had, um, within the union, you had, um, uh, organiz you had a, a particular local that may have just been African American or Mexican American or, or white. And so what the Department of Justice did in this case was sought uh, for, sought an injunction uh, to, to uh, force the union to merge. The judge ended up ruling in favor of the Department of Justice and uh, agreed that 
the International Longshoremen's Association had violated the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but he stopped short and uh, decided that it would be better for the Court of Appeals to decide what the remedy was. The Court of Appeals eventually decided that he was correct, and they remanded it back so uh, to basically implement uh, a merger of the union so that uh, the separate but equal um, um, position that the union was taking uh, would not hold. Medrano versus Ali, this was a case um, in which the United Farm Workers uh, of the AFL-CIO sued the Texas Rangers uh, because the Texas Rangers uh, attempted to break a 1967 uh, melon strike in Stark County. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Stark County, the county seat of Stark County is Rio Grande City. Um, and, and Judge Gossett participated as a member of a three-court panel and eventually decided uh, that the police authorities were openly hostile to the strike and individual strikers and used their law enforcement powers to suppress the farm workers' strike. The, his ruling gave farm workers the right to strike to protest deplorable working conditions. This case is still cited uh, in support of injunctions prohibiting police from using their authority as peace officers uh, to arrest, stop, disperse, or imprison labor organizers without adequate cause. And then uh, Turner versus American Bar Association, there was a group of plaintiffs who were part of an organization that um, they had been uh, accused of tax evasion, and they, um, uh, they, they thought they had a constitutional right to uh, represent themselves in federal court. And this, they sued uh, every judge on, 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 in, in, in the country, practically speaking. For some reason, they left Judge Gadsa out, so Chief Justice Berger appointed Judge Gadsa to hear the case, and it was a consolidated group of cases from all over the country uh, that he ended up hearing. And, and he, he essentially found um, that there was no constitutional right uh, to represent yourself in federal court and protected, uh, and, and basically protected, protected the principle that, uh, at least in federal court, uh, you had to have a, a license to practice law. Yeah, Judge Goddess, Judge Goddess had many, many stories. Um, when Jimmy Carter appointed him to the, when, well, when Jimmy Carter was elected uh, in 1976, uh, he was looking for an attorney general. And he called the judge in his office, and the judge thought it was a prank. Uh, so, so he hung up on him. <laughs> Later, uh, many, many a deer hunting season uh, as a child in, in South Texas, I spent with Judge Goddess at a ranch uh, near Rio Grande City. And it was there that the president finally caught up with him and called him and asked him, you know, that he would like him to be uh, the attorney general uh, under his administration. He would have been the first Mexican-American attorney general. For whatever reason, Judge Garza declined. Um, he liked being a judge, and of course, it was three years later that, uh, judge, that the president appointed him to the Fifth Circuit. One of his law clerks, who's now a uh, federal prosecutor in South Texas, tells another story. Um, um, how many of you have been to South Texas, to Brownsville, Corpus Christi? Okay. Well, so you know that if you, if you are traveling from Brownsville to Corpus Christi, uh, about an hour and a half north of the border. Um, I was there two days ago. Uh, you have to go through a checkpoint. It's another story. I've always wondered why I'd have to declare my citizenship, you know, an, an hour and a half north of where I was born. But we'll save that for another day. Uh, but back there, and in the nineteen, in the in the early seventies, um, the the checkpoint what, what isn't what it was today. You know, it's a huge building, and it's got fifty cameras, and you know it. It's taking pictures of you, and it's scanning your license plate, and uh, taking x-rays of trucks that are going by and all that. But in the 1970s, it wasn't over there. It was, it was pretty sparse. So, they, um, so, so, so back then, it was very sparse, right? And they, um, it might have been one or two Border Patrol agents. And what they would do is that they saw a suspicious vehicle, a suspicious vehicle that was approaching the, uh, the station, uh, which was temporary, because sometimes it wasn't there. So if, if, so what these guys would do if they were approaching the checkpoint and they saw the Border Patrol, they would just turn right back. 
Well, Judge Gatza had a good sense of humor. These, these Border Patrol agents would always testify in his court. So um, what he decided to do, he was with this particular law clerk, and uh, he was driving up to the checkpoint. Uh, he saw the Border Patrol agents. Well, he decided to play a practical joke. So what he did is he turned back around, figuring, well, they're going to chase me back, too. And, of course, they did. They, they, uh, they, the, the Border Patrol agents chased him back, and when they realized who they had stopped, um, he started laughing, right? <laughs> you know, so um, the, the, one of his um, other successors in South Texas is Judge Ricardo Hinojosa. Uh, Judge Ricardo Hinojosa is on the United States Sentencing Commission and uh, on, uh, while, while Judge Garza was in his hospital bed as, as he rose in years, um, he, he actually swore Judge Inohosa in to the Sentencing Commission. This is the this is the federal courthouse in Brownsville uh, that bears the judge's name. Um, after their passing, uh, the, the 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 Congress uh, decided to name this federal courthouse after both uh, Judge Reynaldo Garza and my father. A few interesting pictures. Um, on your top left, uh, that was after Judge Garza's uh, Senate confirmation hearing. Uh, he was in Washington. He visited with uh, Lyndon B. Johnson and, and, and President Kennedy. Um, to the right, to, your, to the left of that picture, uh, is actually on LBJ's ranch. And that is the famous Mexican comedian, Cantinflas, uh, that, that LBJ is introducing him to. And that you'll see a picture of the judge uh, in his robe behind his desk. And later on in life, when his law clerks were, um, you know, celebrating one of his uh, birthdays or when he took senior status, I think it was, uh, they raised uh, a significant amount of money and presented it uh, to the University of Texas in Brownsville in his honor. And then finally, uh, if you haven't been to Brownsville, um, the time to come is in February because it's Charo Days, and that's the judge and his wife uh, celebrating uh, Charo Days that, that we do every year. I do want to make special uh, mention of the fact that Judge Reynaldo Garza of Brownsville, Texas, passed away this week. He was 89 years old. Uh, in 1961, President Kennedy appointed Judge Garza to the district court in Texas. Judge Garza was one of the first Hispanic federal judges in America. He's a great Texan. Those of us who are from Texas were proud to say we're both Texans. And he was the son of Mexican immigrants. He was a shining example of the American dream. He was a good man, and he made this country a better place. And we honor his memory today. Reynaldo Garza was born July 7, 1915 just a block from where the Gateway International Bridge stands today. His mother used to tell him that he just missed the fireworks on July 4th, but she could hear the guns of the Mexican Revolution across the river on the day that he was born. His father, Ignacio, brought his wife Soy La Guerra to Brownsville two weeks after they were married in 1901. She never put a lick of rouge or paint her nails or nothing. Uh -huh. She dedicated her life to her home and her children. Sir. His father had come to Brownsville to manage the city's only bank. Judge Garza's life was shaped by his parents, especially his father. When my dad died, it, it, it really hurt me, you know. I, I, I've been going to mass. I try to go every day if I can. And I still do. Five years after he was dead, I, I would still have a problem and say, I'm going to ask Dad, see? Huh? But that was the one that gave me the right answer, so yeah. I called myself many times. I better ask Daddy. The judge, as everyone called him, was the first Mexican-American nominated as a federal judge in the United States. The year was 1961 and the late President John F. Kennedy 
appointed him to serve in the United States District Court for the Southern District of Texas. He began his service on April 29th, 1961. When they called me about it, I said, honey, uh, we're going to have to take a hell of a cut. You know, I was making over $100,000 a year, clear to me, and the job paid 22500 at that time. You know, it took me 20 years to get to be making what I was making as a lawyer. And, and I remember she said, uh, I think she lived to regret it, you know. But she said, honey, I remember when you told Alan Shivers when he wanted to make you a state judge, that the only judgeship you would ever take would be a federal judgeship. Huh? Taking money isn't everything, she told me. No, yes it is. And in the newspapers that carried the news of this historic appointment, Judge Garza said, I hope I got the appointment because I was qualified, not because I was a Mexican-American. It is a great challenge. My actions on the bench will reflect all Hispanics. For that reason, I know I have to do a good job, and I will try. Once a judge, always a judge. Judge Garza carried that philosophy with him throughout his more than 40 years of service as a federal judge. I had the Corpus Christi docket for five years, and I had to go try cases in Laredo, and I tried cases in Victoria, and in Galveston, and in Houston. And when I was chief judge, I had to go everywhere. Well into his 80s, you could still find him at the federal courthouse in his office writing opinions, telling stories, and of course, a few jokes. I had a young man from Donna, from a very well-known family there. And uh, I sentenced him to five years in the penitentiary, see? And I was gonna tell him that I was gonna probate it. But before I could do it, when I told him I hereby sentenced you to five years in the penitentiary, the poor kid just passed out, or fainted, and hit the machine that <laughs> Lloyd Horn had, you know, take it, hit it with his head. And, uh, and I said, revive him, Brian, put some water on him. <laughs> and then I told him I was gonna <laughs> suspend the sentence and put him on probation. So. A few blocks from the courthouse is where Judge Garza began his college education. After graduating from Brownsville High School in 1933, he enrolled at Brownsville Junior College, now UT Brownsville and Texas Southmost College. Those were very difficult times. The country was in a depression. Everyone was suffering. Judge Garza held down several jobs and was coaching basketball, football, and anything else he could find as he worked his way through college. After graduating from Brownsville Junior College in 1935 with an Associate of Arts degree, Judge Garza went on to the University of Texas in Austin, where he received a combined degree of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Laws. His class was the first required to take the state bar exam. When the graduates signed up for the exam at the Supreme Court, Judge Garza was the only one who paid his $2 fee even before he received the results of his bar exam. A clerk remembered him as cocky and confident. And, and, and you know when when uh, they nominated me for judge, you know, the FBI really goes over. And uh, when I was up there for my nomination, Jed Hoover told me, he said, we never let anybody see a uh, uh, FBI investigation report. But since this one, nobody ever said a bad word about it, so I'm gonna let you read it. And, and, and that's in there, but that, that clerk said, my God, what a kid, you know, came and said, my God, here's my two dollars, you send me my security. All those things came out, huh? They even checked my barber up there, and oh, they, they really, if you have any skeletons in the closet, they'll find them, huh? But Judge Garza said he wasn't cocky, just prudent. Those were depression days, and he paid the money because he didn't know how long he actually would have those two dollars. Judge Garza's deep interest and commitment to education began with his election to the Brownsville School Board of Trustees. He also served as a commissioner for the city of Brownsville, the first Hispanic to serve on the city commission. This experience served 
as his foundation for public service. Subsequently, he was named by several Texas governors to numerous state committees whose work has resulted in significant changes in education. He served on the Committee of 25 on Education Beyond High School, which created the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. In December of 1974, Judge Garza became Chief Judge of the Southern District of Texas. Five years later, in 1979, President Jimmy Carter appointed him to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, where he served as a senior judge. In 1987, he was appointed Chief Judge of the U.S. Temporary Emergency Court of Appeals. Hispanics have served on several presidential cabinets, but Judge Garza would have been the first Mexican-American ever appointed by a president to serve in a cabinet had he accepted President Carter's offer to become the United States Attorney General. Everyone in the community held their breath when word of the offer spread in the city. Instead, he chose to remain in the place he held dear, to be with his family, friends, and community he held close to his heart. He chose to continue to serve his country as a federal judge. Judge Garza assumed senior status in 1982, and although his last court sitting was in April of 2001, he continued working as a circuit judge until his death. In April of 2001, on the anniversary of his 40th year on the federal bench, the judge's law clerks established the Honorable and Mrs. Reynaldo G. Garza Scholarship Endowment at UTB TSE. His law clerks contributed and with matching funds from the Houston Endowment, generated a total of $125,250, one of the largest endowments created at UTB TSE. You uh, law clerks have been part of my life and uh, I've been a very lucky man. I've had very, very fine law clerks. Each one of you brought something new in my life. My wife Bertha has been an inspiration to me, and I'm sure you have looked upon her as your second mother, like somebody said, because she really uh, enjoys having you around us. You all are my, part of my family. By his side, through it all, was his wife, Berta. They met for the first time in high school and in a 2001 interview, he told the story of the day he set eyes on the woman that would become his wife. I saw this girl getting some books out of the locker and, and I said, uh, uh, I said, Angel, who, who's that? Oh, you know her. Bertha Chapman, she's a sister of Joe and Raul, and well, I, I knew the family, and, and I remember I told uh, Uncle, you know, I said, you know, Uncle, that's the girl I'm gonna marry right there. And Bertha always said that I was very conceited, see? And I said, no, I wasn't conceited, I knew what I wanted, see? The Garzas were married on June 9th, 1943, and this year they celebrated 61 years of marriage. Together, they raised a family of five children. Sons Reynaldo and David followed in their father's footsteps and are attorneys. Ignacio, a certified public accountant, continues his father's dedication to public service as a former mayor of the city of Brownsville. Daughter Berta is a school teacher, and Monica, an accountant, continues the family's tradition of valuing the importance of education. The Garzas have 12 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren three daughters-in-law and one son-in-law. Judge Garza has been the recipient of numerous honors and awards, including elementary schools in Brownsville and McAllen that bear his name. In 1993, Texas Southmost College honored him as their very first distinguished alumnus, and the University of Texas at Austin and the UT Law School followed suit in bestowing him similar honors. His life was the subject of a book entitled all rise, Reynaldo G. Garza, the first Mexican-American federal judge. But the judge did not work to seek awards or honors. He worked out of a great sense of responsibility to seek justice for the common good. Whether in the courtroom or outside the courtroom, he used his skills as a powerful and articulate advocate for the many who were not so powerful or skilled 
or articulate. He was the intelligent, deliberate, and often the loud voice of the people, whether it was for the United Fund, the Boy Scouts, the Knights of Columbus, or his favorite subject, education. And then on his deathbed, uh, when he got, gathered us all around him, and I think he knew he was dying, and he told my mother, he said, you know, I'm not gonna leave you very much money, but I'm gonna leave you eight kids. <laughs> and he said, each one ought to be worth at least a million dollars to you. <laughs> and then he told us what he truly reported, that he wasn't leaving us very much either but that he had tried to give us the best education possible and that that was something that nobody could take away from us. And uh, what prophetic words. If it hadn't been for the education that I received, I uh, never would have done what I have been able to accomplish. Judge Reynaldo Garza, a man who we admire and love, we thank you for your years your inspiration, and dedication to ideals and standards for which we should all strive. You touched many lives, changed our nation, and will never be forgotten. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that story. Um, before I finish, there's a few thoughts. One, he was a uh, I remember him as a um, very, very devoted Catholic. And every time, even to this day, I see the Knights of Columbus, um, you know, in their, in their hats and in their, uh, in their suits, uh, he's the first one I think of because uh, if, if, if back in Brownsville in, in the early days, if you thought Knights of Columbus, uh, Judge Reynaldo Garces is who you thought as he would think about. The other thing is, I remember my father preceded him in death, even though he was quite a bit younger. Um, but I, I do remember uh, uh, that the first person to visit uh, my mother um, that that on that you know that that day that that my father had passed was Mrs. Goddess of the Judge uh, was having a very difficult time himself. He passed away about five or six years later, and she was a, a wonderful and caring person herself. And a few other stories. The, um, the, these, these, these men served as, um, as federal judges in deep south Texas. And they heard, they, you know, they presided over thousands and thousands of cases. And if you knew them well, some of the stories they tell you about is some of the racial profiling that they themselves endured. And, um, you, you know, there, there, there's uh, there's stories in the Matt Lauer show where they were both interviewed about, uh, you know, even as federal judges, they'd be, they'd be traveling from uh, either Brownsville to Laredo to go sit in the court there, and of course they had shaded windows and they'd get stopped, and next thing you know, the border patrol agent would knock on the door, and you know, realize, oh wow, it's a federal judge we're stopping, and. You know, of course, they would get angry. They would, what, what are you stopping us for? You know, we have uh, the Fourth Amendment, and there must be some issues with respect to your training. In fact, there's a particular story where one particular Border Patrol agent, um, you know, ha ha had knocked on their door, and he thought he was going to get in trouble. Uh, but what they did is they called the supervisor and said, you know, it's not the agent that I'm concerned about. It's you because of because you're responsible for the training. One other story, there's a common, um, where it's a, we, we, we live in a small community and many of us know very, very grew up with each other, but um, the former ambassador to Mexico, Tony Garza, is, is from Brownsville. He's very close to both Judge Garza and my father. And I'll leave you with this funny story because these, 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 these guys had a lot of good stories. Um, before he was ever, a, ever entered into political life, Ambassador Gatsa was a, a lawyer and uh, he was in some instances appointed uh, to, uh, to, to represent uh, criminal clients, uh, you know, as, 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 as pro bono work. So one day, and this was a story in my father's court, uh, they would line up defendants uh, for sentencing 
And both, both these men were very, very strict about punctuality. If you were one minute late, you got sent to jail. So there were a few people that were running late, and the criminal defendants were sitting there before uh, the judge, and uh, the judge called out the marshals, you know, go get everybody who's not here. And the last one to arrive was, and he was late, was the, the later to be ambassador. And the ambassador turned to his client and he said, uh, how are you doing? And the client who was about to be sentenced to prison said, well, I'm doing okay, but you're not. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, thank you for having me. It's been an honor. It's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to tell uh, the story of, of, of such a great man that I had the pleasure of knowing. And, and, and it's also an honor uh, for me uh, to be here as well. Thank you. All right, thank you, Congressman Vela, for uh, bringing this really important story to the Library of Congress. Uh, I know I really enjoyed uh, listening to the personal anecdotes that you had uh, with Judge Garza. Uh, so it's really important that we preserve this history so that future generations know uh, where we have come from and, and how far we've come. Um, Dr. Billington and the Hispanic Cultural Society have a small uh, gift for you. So Dr. Billington, would you like to come up and uh, present? Uh, just a few last uh, final announcements. We have a few copies of the Hispanic Americans in Congress uh, book, so if you would like uh, one, if you could please uh, talk to Reggie, who is over there. We have limited copies, so uh, see him soon if you uh, would like one. Uh, also, we have lots of um, other events going on uh, in the next four weeks. Uh, if you haven't gotten a calendar in your email of the events, uh, please let me know and I'll send it to you. Or we have uh, paper copies here uh, that you can take. So thank you. We invite you to um, have uh, some networking time. And we also have um, a few uh, Latin fair items uh, for you to taste. So thank you for coming and supporting the Hispanic Cultural Society. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.